glad to have you with us today in person or online. Um, we're just going to celebrate our Lord and our Savior. He is risen. He is alive today. And we're going to give all praise and glory to his name. This is a new song that we're doing. Uh, but it just talks about God's grace. And, um, you know, we may not deserve it, but um, his love is boundless. His grace never ending. And he is for us today. One, two.
They're trying to drum up excitement for it. But this morning, we aren't here to talk about the walking dead. We're here to talk about the dead being made alive. But the response to the resurrection was very much the same as our response to a zombie apocalypse would be. Some people were afraid. 
Some people tried to pretend it wasn't happening. Some doubted and some worshiped. Let's look in Matthew chapter 28 and we'll look at all these reactions here. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb, and there was a violent earthquake, and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Now the angel's appearance was like lightning, his clothes were white as snow, the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they shall see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city, and they reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised the plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while you were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and the story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, and when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. So there in that story, you see all four responses, right? Lots of people were afraid. Some people tried to pretend it didn't happen. They tried to ignore it. Some doubted, and some worshipped. And I think people are having these same responses to the resurrection, even today, even right now, in this room, in our city, in our community. Some people are afraid. Some people are trying to act like it didn't happen. Some doubt, and some worship. Which one are you? Which one am I? First of all, some people are afraid. If you look closely, fear was the most common response throughout the story. The women were afraid, the disciples were afraid, the soldiers were afraid. There's a lot of fear here. According to psychology today, over 60% of Americans have some unreasonable fear. They have an unreasonable fear of something. Maybe it's spiders, maybe it's snakes, maybe it's speaking in public. You know, we all have some unreasonable, or most people have an unreasonable fear. Most people are paralyzed by something that won't really hurt them. As human beings, we're really a fearful people. You probably have some fears in your life. Maybe this week you thought about some fears. You're like, there's wars, there's pandemics, there's job insecurity, there's economic inflation. Like, there's a lot of things to be fearful about. Our news channels play on our fear. Marketers exploit our fear. But do you know what the most common command in Scripture is? Do not fear. That's right, God. The most common thing that God commands his people not to do is, don't be afraid. Now, I've heard lots of messages where priests and pastors stand up and shout about greed and lust, and we should because those are destructive and they hurt people and they hurt relationships. But you know what I don't hear a lot of time? People standing up here and saying, don't be afraid. But that's what God commanded us over and over again in the most. The most common message God has for humans is, Stop being afraid. I'm with you. I'm for you. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to the dark side, right? (laughs) No. But all kidding aside, how often does fear keep us from doing what we should, what we could? How often does it lead us to do something we shouldn't? If the resurrection is true, it means death is not defeat. We don't need to fear the end of our lives. We can pour out our lives for a cause and it won't be wasted because death is not the end of our story. It's a powerful thing to not fear death. If there's a group of people who truly believe that they will live again, that death can't stop them, they will change the world. Our fear keeps us from taking risks to right the world. Fear is all about scarcity. We're afraid we don't have enough. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough resources. We don't have enough life. The resurrection takes away our fear and turns it on its head. We are living out of the abundance of life without end, won for us by Jesus. 
Some people were afraid. Some people tried to pretend it didn't even happen. Some people tried to craft clever spins on what happened. They were so committed to the status quo, they couldn't create space for the miraculous. Sometimes that's exactly where I am. When we ignore a problem, we put it in the back of our minds. Do you ever do this? You're like, I know I need to do all this. I don't want to do it. I just can't handle it right now. Put it in the back of your mind. But it's not gone from your mind. It's living back there. Our subconscious still thinks about it. It takes mental effort to try to ignore a problem. And that effort itself can cause additional stress. Stress. Has anyone seen this meme floating around the internet? Dog sitting in the house on fire and he's like, this is fine. You ever feel like that? There's a lot of weeks I feel like that. I'm like, this is fine. I'll make it through. I'll smile through it. It's okay. There's another meme I also hate to read. But I think it's true. It goes, the best way to eliminate the stress you're feeling is to do the task you've been avoiding. To address the thing that might be painful. To come with terms with the reality that you don't like. Our culture has been designed to distract us rather than get us to face the stuff that will bring us healing. Dr. Elizabeth Scott, a PhD in psychology, said, avoidance coping is a maladaptive form of coping in which a person changes their behavior to avoid thinking about feeling or doing difficult things. She goes on to say that in those type of people, anxiety skyrockets when we spend our limited energy trying to mentally create pathways to avoid our problem rather than address our problem. You see, Alex, what does that have to do with the resurrection? We had chief priests and Pharisees and soldiers who were going to all this effort and energy. They were spending all this money instead of just facing up with the simple truth that the man that they had killed was back alive again. And sometimes, some of us, maybe you're watching online, maybe you're even here, we go through a lot of effort to try to avoid the fact that God is with us and for us and love us, and we keep trying to push him out of our minds, and every time we think about him, every time he whispers to us, I'm real and I love you, give me your life, we say, no, 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 I want to do my thing, I have my plans, I have my priorities, and I'm just going to keep pushing you out of my mind. Our entire culture has been designed to distract us from the reality of death. After a tragedy or at a funeral, we have a few sobering minutes of clarity. We think, we realize that all of us are marching towards inevitable death. I've seen people, family members of mine, who just live to party and get wasted and like blow all their money on drugs and alcohol, and then a family member dies. And it's like for five minutes, they get real serious and they're like, man, I need to clean up my life. Life is short. I need to change everything. And then what happens? The next day hits, they're like, oh, funeral's in the rear view mirror. I'm going right back to where I was. Our culture is designed to keep us blind to the reality that 100% of people die. It's not 50%. It's not a flip of a coin. Like, man, maybe I'll make it. Like, all of us are going to die. I know that's not a pleasant truth. That's not the, like, exciting Easter message you want to hear, right? But it's a truth we try not to think about. But the resurrection takes this unavoidable enemy and steals the fangs right out of its mouth. The resurrection is either true, and death is simply the gate to more life, or it is false. And life is a series of mindless days spent distancing ourselves or distracting ourselves from our grim destiny. That's the choice you have. Either there's a resurrection, and the story has a good ending with more life, or we're merely spinning our wheels here until we all die. Some of us go to incredible lengths to ignore the fact that God is with us and for us, that he loves us, that he died for us. Some of us go to incredible lengths to deny the fact that he loves us, we try to distract ourselves, and we forget that he showered our world with good gifts because he's generous and loving, and he has done so much. The good in your life is not by accident, it's by divine design. There is a good and loving God who loves you. The resurrection tells us that God doesn't abandon his own. The resurrection is working to make everything sad untrue. Why would we want to ignore it? Why would we want to ignore him? So some pretended it didn't happen, some were afraid, and some doubted. Now, this is the category where I often find myself in. Okay, I'm going to tell you, Monday of this week when I woke up, my body was kind of sore. I got out of bed late. I was headed into work late. And I was not like, man, 
Jesus came back from the dead. This is a completely different world. This is a radically different story. This story has a good ending. I was like, oh, this doesn't feel like a world where miracles happen. This feels like a world where I can barely walk into work because I'm sore and tired and old. Some mornings I wake up and it just doesn't feel like a world where a dead man came back from life. I don't know about you, but for me, doubt is where I spend too much of my time. It feels like a world where miracles can't happen. It feels like a world where people live and die, eat and sleep, work and play, and one day simply end. Sometimes I think about what would it take for me to believe completely to have no more doubts? Like, what would it have to, what would I have to experience in order to have zero doubts? To just know 100% sure with complete confidence and have no doubts. And I think, well, maybe if I was there, right? If I was there and the tomb blew open and Jesus walked out, and I'd be like, I believe now. Well, I've seen it, right? I think if I could only see the resurrected Jesus, then I would have no doubts. But what does it say here in this passage? Verse 16. Or verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Even seeing him, some doubted. That'd probably be me. I'd be the one there, man. Like, he's a hologram. Like, is he even real, you know? Um, Al talked about Thomas a few weeks ago. And Thomas was like, let me touch your scars. Are you really, or are you a hologram? He didn't know what hologram was. But I would think that seeing would be believing. And yet these people saw him. They saw him publicly executed, brutally murdered, and raised again, and yet they had doubts. Now, a pivotal moment for me was when I was in college, I had lots of doubts about Christianity. I was like, okay, my parents taught me this thing. Do I believe this? Is this real? Is this true? Is this not just a nice fairy tale story? Is this real? And I remember wrestling with, do I believe? How do, what do I do with my doubts? And um, I started thinking, like, if I saw it, then I believe. I need to see these things to believe. And then I thought, you know what? I still want to believe. Because I would assume I was on an alien spaceship, and they had me hooked up to some computer simulation. I was in some matrix, and that's what I was seeing. So whether I see it or not, I'm still going to have to exercise faith. I have to believe this isn't a simulation. You know, some of the world's smartest people now um, say, oh, we think the world is just a big computer simulation. I'm like, oh, Elon Musk, you've been watching too much Matrix movies, right? But if I saw that, I would still have doubts. And so what I realized is it's not that I haven't seen enough. It's that I have to choose that despite my doubts, I will exercise faith. See, faith isn't the absence of doubt. See, did dead men come back from life? I believe that. I want to believe that. Am I 100% sure? How can I be 100% sure of anything? Right? Like, we can't be 100% sure, but I think that if you look at the evidence, you consider the alternatives, and you say, I am going to act on something that I hope and believe is true despite my doubts. Faith is not the absence of doubts. It is acting despite your doubts. Alfred Lord Tennyson once said, there is more faith in honest doubt than in just mindlessly reciting the creed. What would it take for you to believe in the resurrection? Think about this. Like, if I saw this, then I'd absolutely believe in the resurrection. What would it take for you to become a student of Jesus' way of life? What would convince you? Maybe you don't need that. Maybe even if you had that, you would still have more doubts. You would have new excuses. Maybe right now, right here today, you would have everything you need to believe. And the question is not, why don't I have more? The question is, will you believe with what you have? And finally, some worshipped. Some were afraid. Some pretended it didn't happen. Some doubted. And some worshipped. Some, not all. We see the women bow down and worshipped. Some of his disciples worshipped but doubted. Some believed that the world had changed because now a dead man had walked out from the grave. That the story they were in could have a good ending, that the ending of all our stories doesn't have to be death, and they worshipped Jesus. There's really only two options. No matter what religion or what background, whether you're spiritual or not religious, whatever, if you're completely materialistic and not spiritual at all, there are only really two options. You can either believe that our lives end in death, 
or that our lives end in more life. Those are the two beliefs. Every human being on this planet gets to make a choice. Do you believe that life ends in death, or does life end in more life? The Christian faith is built on this belief that death does not get the final word. Death does not win. Like Jesus, we will die, but we will laugh and sing and worship on this ball of rock hurtling through space again. We may be gone, but we're coming back, just like he's coming back. Our graves will become gardens that we will tend because we believe that King Jesus has defeated sin and death. Our loved ones will dance on the graves on the very ground where we put them in because we believe that King Jesus has defeated sin and death. Because the story of Easter, the story of Jesus, the story of Christianity is that the love of God overcomes the debt of men and the curse of death. Jesus buried debt and death in the ground, and he walked out and left them dead in his tomb. Marissa and Al are going to return, and we're going to sing. We're going to shout and sing and speak of the worship and majesty of Jesus. We're going to worship our risen king. We're going to celebrate life, conquering death. Let us be the remnant that worship. Some feared, some pretended it didn't happen, some doubted, and some worship. Let us be those who worship this morning. Some were afraid, some pretended it didn't happen, some doubted, and some worshiped. Which one are you?
stand. We're just going to give everything, all the praise, all the honor to his name.
Pep community. If you're a first time visitor, you're visiting with us for the first time, or watching online for the first time, we're so glad that you're here. For every first time guest, we donate $25 to Compassion International. If you'd like to give to support the work of Horizon, you can do so at our website, relationshipnotreligion.com, or via Venmo or PayPal, where you can donate in the box by the front door. Um, today, the, what do you call it, Jeffrey? The, the statement for the day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. <laughs> Sin and death are defeated. The king is coming, and everything sad will be made untrue. 